turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and I'm going to begin reading in verse number 1. 1 Corinthians 15. Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel, which I preach to you, which also you received, and in which you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast that word which I preach to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he was seen by Cephas, then by the Twelve. After that he was seen by over five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain to the present, but some have fallen asleep. After that he was seen by James, then by all the apostles, and then last of all he was seen by me also, as by one born out of due time. For I am the least of the apostles, who am not worthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. Therefore, whether it was I or they, so we preach, and so you believe. 
Now, if Christ has preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty, and your faith is also empty. Yes, and, and we are found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he did not raise up if, in fact, the dead do not rise. For if the dead do not rise then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most pitiable. But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. But each one in his own order, Christ, the firstfruits, afterward those who are Christ at his coming. Then comes the end, when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father, when he puts an end to all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be destroyed is death. Father God, we're so thankful for the privilege we have on this Easter Sunday morning to look at your word once again. We're thankful for the realities of these things. We're thankful that these are not fables. They are not fairy tales. They are not just stories made up. They are not mythology. They are the truth. And we're thankful for that. And I am thankful, Lord, that I have experienced the reality of these things. And I'm sure others hearing my voice, are also thankful that they have experienced the reality of these things, that we know Jesus Christ as our Savior and Lord because we have heard the gospel that Jesus died for our sins, that he was buried, that he rose again on the third day. And now if we but believe in him, we can have everlasting life. Lord, we believe it, we thank you for it, and we pray today that as we look at some of these things related to this highest day on the, on the Christian calendar, that, Lord, you'll just speak to our hearts. Holy Spirit, you'll take control of everything that is said. I pray that wherever people are hearing this, listening to this, whether they're sitting in their living rooms, gathered around kitchen tables, whatever they're doing, I pray as they hear this, the Holy Spirit will get hold of their heart, whether they're believers or unbelievers, and I pray you'll do a work. If, if folks need to, to hear the gospel for the first time and let it really get into their hearts and make a change and, 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 and let them be saved, I pray that would be the case. And if Christians or discouraged, or down, or any other uh, negative thing, uh, especially during these days uh, that we're going through right now, I pray they'd be so encouraged as they're reminded of the truths that are here. So speak to us, bless our hearts, help me, Father, to preach as I ought to preach, uh, only saying what I should, and uh, saying everything I should, and uh, just help me, I pray. And uh, bless this, we give it to you in Jesus' name, amen. Well, it's Easter Sunday, 2020, and of course in our church we have a custom on Easter. It's not unique to us. It's actually a custom that the Church of Jesus Christ has followed probably all the way back to the very earliest days, maybe even back to that very first Easter Sunday. I say to you, he is risen, and you say back to me, he is risen indeed. And of course in this format, I can't hear you. I'm assuming that right now some of you said it. I don't know. But uh, uh, we're going to do it again. And I want you to pry, re reply so loudly that, uh, that everybody in your household will hear it. If you're sitting there by yourself, I want everybody in the household to hear you say, He is risen! And now let's do, now let's do this maybe even a little bit more interestingly today, since we're in a completely different format. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to go open a window and stick your head out. Or I want you to go to your front door and stand there on the front door. You say, I'm in my bathrobe. That's okay. Whatever you're in, just go to the front door and stand there and say, he is risen. He is risen indeed. So that all your neighbors can hear. Go ahead. I'm going to wait a second while you go and do that. Go do that right now. He is risen. He is risen indeed. I'll wait. Did you do it? Are you back? It is Easter 2020 and we celebrate that truth 
that he is risen. He is risen indeed. But the unusual circumstances surrounding the holiday this year makes my mind go to some strange places. It actually makes my mind go, uh, one of the very first places I go is, is back to a Christmas story. Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, you remember that story? The premise of it is that there is such a worldwide storm taking place on Christmas Eve that Santa Claus is forced to cancel Christmas. You remember that? I mean, many of you have probably watched that, that TV cartoon so many times. It was my first wife Beth's favorite thing. We had to watch it every single Christmas. You've probably watched it so many times that you can actually hear in your mind Santa's voice saying, We'll have to cancel Christmas. And to some, it might look like Easter is canceled this year. I mean, church buildings are mostly empty, right? Christians who take church attendance seriously all year long and are usually extra diligent to worship the Lord on Easter are, are sitting at home today. Those who give little thought to worshiping the Lord 364 days a year uh, but take pains to ensure they are there in their once per year time on Easter are also sitting at home today. Preachers are still preaching but to empty sanctuaries or flickering screens. So let me ask you, what do you think? Is Easter canceled this year? As you ponder the question, let me share just another Christmas quote that helps answer it. For some reason, Christmas quotations are coming to my mind, even though, even though it's Easter. I don't know why that is. But you remember the Grinch. You remember the Grinch who was the nasty dude who tried to steal Christmas. He tried to cancel Christmas. In the end, he had to face a truth he hadn't thought of before. And I quote, and the Grinch, with his Grinch feet ice cold in the snow, stood puzzling and puzzling. How could it be so? It came without ribbons. It came without tags. It came without packages, boxes, or bags. And he puzzled and puzzled till his puzzler was sore. Then the Grinch thought of something he hadn't before. What if Christmas, he thought, doesn't come from a store? What if Christmas, perhaps, means a little bit more? Well, make no mistake, my friends, Easter is not canceled. Make no mistake, Easter is not about church buildings. Easter is, a is about that fact that we just shouted out our front door a minute ago, that Jesus Christ is alive. Easter is recognition of this most vital truth for the believer, the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The passage we read just a few minutes ago it's often referred to, and there may be a notation in your Bible that says something like this, but it's often referred to as the resurrection chapter in the Bible. Because in this passage, Paul very plainly describes the main points of the gospel and delves very deeply into that one part of the gospel, the resurrection. He says in verses 3 through 5, I deliver to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures, and that he was seen. That's the gospel. Christ died for our sins. That happened on Friday. We talked about that in our Good Friday service just a couple of days ago. He was buried from Friday evening through Sunday morning, three days. And on the third day, Sunday, he rose again. Lo, in the grave he lay, Jesus my Savior waiting that coming day. Jesus, my Lord. Vainly, they watch his bed. Jesus, my Savior. Vainly, they seal the dead. Jesus, my Lord. Death cannot keep his prey. Jesus, my Savior. He tore the bars away. Jesus, my Lord. And up from the grave, he arose with a mighty triumph for his foes. He arose a victor of the dark domain, and he lives forever with his saints to reign. He arose, he arose, hallelujah, Christ arose. That's the reality of Easter. And it cannot be canceled. It can never be canceled. I saw a quote recently. Some of you have seen it. It said, Easter cannot be canceled. 2,000 years ago, all the forces of hell tried that, and they failed. Amen. Satan couldn't do away with it then. The demons of hell cannot do away with it now. 2,000 years of humanism and atheism and, and virulent unbelief have not done away with it, and this little virus ain't going to do it either. Easter cannot be canceled because, you see, he is risen. He is still risen. 
He is risen indeed. However, I want you to notice that Paul kind of speculated a little bit in this passage that we just read. He asked a question here. He asked the question, what if there was no resurrection? What if there wasn't? And I don't think we'll do damage to the word if we, if we just substitute that uh, kind of according to our premise this morning and we ask, what if there was no Easter? I think that's what Paul was asking. What if there was no resurrection? What if there was no Easter? And as he speculated, Paul described some things that would naturally follow if there were no resurrection or if Easter were canceled. And I want to share a few of those with you this morning uh, from this passage. Several things he said. First of all, look at verse number 13 and notice that Paul said, if there's no Easter, Jesus lied. If there's no Easter, Jesus lied. If there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. Verse number 13. You say, well, that doesn't say he lied. No, but it would, it would demonstrate that he lied because he promised that he would rise from the dead. John chapter, 12 and, or John chapter 2 and verse number 19, Jesus answered and said unto them, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. He promised that if he rose, you and I would rise too. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? John chapter 11, verses 25 and 26. Outside of Lazarus' tomb, he made that promise. And so if there's no Easter, after Jesus said these things, if there's no Easter, it would make Jesus Christ the biggest liar that has ever lived on the face of the earth. I mean, think of the thousands, the millions, the multiplied millions who have been fooled by this man if he indeed was lying. Nobody in history has influenced more people than Jesus Christ. Nobody. You've all, you've all read the, 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 the thing that you've seen on plaques in people's homes or doctor's office walls or uh, just read it at various places. He was born in an obscure village, the child of a peasant woman. He grew up in still another, another village where he worked in a carpenter shop until he was 30. Then for three years, he was an itinerant preacher. He never wrote a book. He never held an office. He never had a family or owned a house. He didn't go to college. He never visited a big city. He never traveled 200 miles from the place where he was born. He did none of the things one usually associates with greatness. He had no credentials but himself. He was only 33 when the tide of public opinion turned against him. His friends ran away. He was turned over to his enemies. He went through the mockery of a trial. He was nailed to a cross between two thieves. And while he was dying, his executioners gambled for his clothing, the only property he had on earth. When he was dead, he was laid in a borrowed grave through the pity of a friend. Nineteen centuries have come and gone. Twenty now. And today he is the central figure of the human race and the leader of mankind's progress. All the armies that ever marched, all the navies that ever sailed, all the parliaments that have ever sat have not affected the life of man on this earth as much as that one solitary life. It's true. It's true. Nobody in history has influenced more people than Jesus Christ. And if there's no Easter, if there's no resurrection, Paul said it's a lie. If there is no resurrection of the dead, Christ is not risen. Paul went on. Look at verse number 14. If Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty. If there's no Easter, no resurrection, preaching is worthless. That word empty there means vain or, or empty or worthless. Why preach? There, there can be no doubt God, according to the scriptures, chose preaching as a vital tool for reaching people with the gospel. Paul told the Corinthians, the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believed. For 2,000 years, the gospel of Jesus Christ has been preached. Multiple thousands, multiplied thousands of men have given their lives to the cause of preaching the gospel. Think of all the preachers that have come and gone. Think of, think of some of the preachers that are mentioned in the Bible itself. Noah, Nehemiah, David, Solomon, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Peter, John, Paul, just to name a few. 
Think of some of the preachers of the last couple of centuries that are well-known. Billy Sunday, D.L. Moody, Jonathan Edwards, Billy Graham. Think of some who are well-known in our day. Alistair Begg, right up the road from us. Timothy Keller, John MacArthur, Chuck Swindoll, Vadi Bauckham. Multiplied thousands of preachers right now are standing in pulpits and preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And, and then think of this. Think of it. Every word of it is lies. Every word ever preached is a lie if there is no resurrection. And it's a worthless exercise if there is no Easter. If Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty. Paul's still not done. He says in verse number 14, if Christ is not risen, risen, then our preaching is empty and your faith is also empty. So he makes the point that if there is no Easter, your faith is also worthless. Now, I know you know this. But let me say it anyway. Faith is a key word for the Christian. Acts 16.31, we quote it often in this church. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. Belief, faith, key word for the believer. Romans 1.17, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. 2 Corinthians 5.7, we walk by faith, not by sight. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse number 8, by grace you have been saved through faith. That none of yourselves, it's a gift of God. Hebrews eleven six without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Faith is the basis of Christianity. It's the basis, and the basis of our faith is the resurrection. Paul said that Jesus was declared to be the Son of God with power according to the Spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead in Romans chapter 1 and verse number 4. You see, if there's no resurrection, if there were no Easter, there'd be nothing to believe in. Christianity wouldn't be any different than Islam. Or Christianity wouldn't be any different than Buddhism or Hinduism or paganism or any other mythology. If Christ is not risen, our preaching is empty, and your faith is also empty, worthless, vain, meaningless. Paul's still not done. He says in verse number 15 that if there is no Easter, Christians are false witnesses. Christians are false witnesses. Yes, and we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he did not raise up, if in fact the dead do not rise. Verse 15. If there is no Easter, then we've already seen in verse 13 that Jesus was the greatest liar who ever lived. But Paul didn't stop there. He said, if there is no Easter, then you and I, who witness to the reality of Easter, are also liars. I mean, start with the Apostle Paul. But the Apostle Paul witnessed to the known world, the entire known world of his day. Did he lie to all of them? He, he wrote 13 books of our New Testament. Some would say 14 because some people believe he wrote the book of Hebrews. We don't know that, but he wrote 13, possibly 14 books of the New Testament. Should we tear them all out of our Bibles? Because he lied. What of Peter? Peter preached to thousands on Pentecost. 3,000 people were saved on that day. All 3,000 of them deceived. Peter wrote two books of the New Testament, first and second Peter. Most believe the Gospel of Mark is a compilation of the preaching and the teaching of the Apostle Peter. Should we tear those out of our Bible as well? What about John? John the Apostle, he wrote five books of our Bible, of our New Testament. Should we tear them out of, of, of the Bible? And of course, there are Christians down through the ages that have witnessed to the reality of Easter, of the resurrection. There are those in our own church who witness to that. I mean, there's me. <laughs> there's you. You and I have witnessed to others. There's the person who told you about Jesus. And Paul says this. This is, this is, a, this is a sobering thought. Paul says that uh, they and we are all liars if there is no resurrection, if there is no Easter. Still not done. He's got more to say. The awful realities of there being no Easter get even worse, I think. He says in verse number 17 that if there is no Easter, you are still a sinner. 
If there is no Easter, if there is no resurrection, you are still a sinner. If Christ be not risen, your faith is futile, you are still in your sins. Well, that's an amazing thought. That's a terrible, terrible thought. The Bible is clear that his death was not enough to save you. His good example was not enough to save you. His, his uh, teachings were not enough to save you. His life on this side of the cross was not enough to save you. There had to be a resurrection. There had to be. And I quoted the verse earlier, Romans 1, 4. He was declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. Now, if there was no Easter, if there was no resurrection, then, then you and I are still lost. That's Paul's point there in verse number 17. We're still lost. I mean, you're still an enemy of God. The Bible says, and Paul wrote to the Colossians in Colossians 1, 21, you who once were alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now has he reconciled. At one time, before we came to Christ, we were enemies of God. We were at enmity with him. And if there's no resurrection, Paul says, that's still our state. You are still daily coming short of the glory of God, the mark uh, that he would have you uh, hit. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's the state we were, we were all in before we trusted Christ as our Savior. And Paul says here that if there is no Easter, if there is no resurrection, we're still in that state, still falling short, constantly, eternally falling short of the glory of God. You're still damned to an eternal hell if there is no resurrection. That's what Paul said there. Jonathan Edwards in his most famous sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, preached this. He said, unconverted men walk over the pit of hell on a rotten covering. And there are innumerable places in this covering so weak that they will not bear their weight. And these places are not seen. He was saying very plainly in that sermon that all of us are so in danger of hell apart from Christ. Unconverted men he was talking about there. Those who haven't trusted Christ. Those who don't believe. Hell is a very real reality. Their destiny. And they don't know when they might fall into it. And see, that's the terrible consequence if there is no Easter, Paul said. If there is no resurrection, you and I are lost forever. If there is no resurrection. If Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. He's still not done. He gives another, which may, may be even worse consequence, depending on your point of view. He says, if there is no Easter, your loved ones are gone forever. Look at verse 18. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. We've all said goodbye to loved ones. We've all been comforted to believe that uh, if they were believers and we are believers, we'll see them again. There's so many promises of scripture that we could turn to there. I've preached that in so many, so many funeral sermons. You know, we'll see them again because they, they believe they were, they were saved. We're saved. We'll see them again one day. But if there's no Easter, Paul said. If there's no resurrection from the dead, Paul said. There is no such hope. Loved ones are just gone. And gone forever. Well, one last one. Paul kind of sums it up, I think, in verse number 19. He says, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most pitiable. He says there that if there is no Easter, we are miserable creatures <laughs> indeed. When, he, when we use the pronoun we... We're saying, we believers, those of us who have trusted in Christ, are the most miserable creatures indeed. And I think Paul here was probably thinking primarily about himself when he wrote that. I can't be sure, but I think he probably was. Thinking of his own sufferings, wondering why he would go through such a life of deprivation and suffering if there was no resurrection. There are places in the Bible where you can read some of those things about the Apostle Paul and see what he went through for the cause of Christ. I'm not going to go into that right now. You can do that on your own. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, uh, verses 23 and following would be a good place to start where he just kind of gives a, summary, a summer, summarization of some of the things that he had gone through. Think of the futility of suffering such a life if the resurrection, if, if Easter is a lie. Perhaps that's what he was thinking as he wrote this. I mean, why was somebody like John Huss burned at the stake if there is no resurrection? Why was Stephen, the first martyr in Acts chapter 7, stoned if there is no resurrection? Why was James beheaded with a sword 
if there is no resurrection? Why was Peter crucified upside down on an X-shaped cross, as tradition tells us he was, if there is no resurrection? Why was the Apostle Paul martyred with a sword by Nero, Emperor Nero, if there is no resurrection? And why have countless millions, down through the, the couple thousand years since Christ died and rose again, why have countless millions given their lives for Christ if there is no resurrection? Why are those in our world today who are told they must convert to another, another religion or be killed, why are so many choosing, even today, death rather than deny the Lord Jesus Christ? Why would they do that if there is no resurrection? Um, mark it down. Paul's summarization is correct. If there isn't something beyond, if there isn't something more, if there isn't something eternal, if there isn't an Easter, if there is no resurrection, then we are of all people on earth the most miserable. Oh, but here's the rub. Here's the rub. There is Easter. And there was and is and will be a resurrection from the dead. I can imagine. I, I, I have an overactive imagination sometimes. And I, I can imagine Apostle Paul's reaction as he was writing verse number 20. I can imagine him laying down his pen. I can imagine him walking to his front door just as you did a moment ago, if you did what you were supposed to do, and shouting out to his front door for all to hear, but now is Christ risen from the dead. I can imagine him shouting that in victory. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah, glory to God. Easter has been real since that first Lord's Day when Jesus Christ walked forth from the grave. Easter has been real down through all the troubles this world has endured in the 2,000 years since. Easter is still real. In the midst of these times when church buildings are empty and our celebrations are so different. It's real. He is risen. And because of that, our preaching is not vain. It's vital. He is risen. Because of that, our faith is not vain. It's the very means of salvation and eternal life. He is risen. Because of that, we're not liars. We're witnesses to the truth. He is risen. Because of that, we are not still in our sins. We have the very righteousness of Christ. He is risen. Because of that, we have not lost our loved ones forever. We will be reunited with those who believed one day. He is risen. Because of that, we are not the most miserable of creatures. No. We're rather the only ones with a reason for living. With apologies to Dr. Seuss, many are wondering and puzzling to know Christians still smile. How can it be so? It comes without flowers. It comes without songs. It comes without buildings or preachers or throngs. And some puzzle and puzzle till their puzzlers are sore. So let's remind them of something they may not have thought of before. What if Easter, you say, isn't just made up lore? What if Easter, perhaps, means a whole lot more. Say it with me one more time, Christians. Say it loud. Say it proud. Believe it. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Easter can never be canceled. Jesus is risen. Precious God, we are so thankful for these glorious truths. And as we are, are facing a different type of an Easter service today, I pray that the reality of the day is, is even more so apparent to us, that Jesus Christ is alive, no matter what we go through, no matter what happens in our world, no matter what's happening in our families, in our homes, Jesus is alive. It's the ultimate truth of the universe. And so I pray today, Father, that as we celebrate Easter in all sorts of different ways, with our families, some alone, uh, sequestered in their homes where they really don't have anybody to share the time with. Uh, Lord, I pray whatever our state, we are so convinced of the reality of Easter. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Easter cannot be canceled, and we're thankful for it. Father, we pray all these things in Jesus' name.
would bear with me for just one more moment, L let me just ask a couple of questions. Two questions, really. The first one is, do you believe this? Do you believe this? And there's going to be one of two answers. There's only two answers to that question. One is yes, and one is no. The vast majority of people on earth, if they're honest with themselves, will answer no. I can't believe this. And, and, and so I want you to know, right now I'm praying for you. And, and I'm hoping that all of, all of the believing uh, uh, brothers and sisters who are listening to this are also praying for you. That the Holy Spirit will get a hold of your heart and help you to see the reality of this thing. If you do not believe this, you will eventually die and you will go to hell. But if you will put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, you can have the same joy, the same purpose in living, the same wonderful future of eternity in heaven with Christ that we have. And so I'm going to ask you today to really, truly think about that question. Do you believe this? And if you don't, I'm going to ask you to pray. Ask the Lord to help you to believe it. Because nothing is more important. And if you say to yourself, I do believe it, but I'm not sure what else to do. Uh, I've never really taken any step of faith. I've never really... Uh, I, I hear people talking about uh, being saved or born again. I don't know what that means. Well, here's what I want you to do. I want you to bow your head right where you are. And if you want to place your faith and trust in Jesus, if you want to be saved on this Easter Sunday 2020, if you want to be sure that you have the same glorious future that those of us who do believe have, then just pray something like this. You can put this in your own words if you want. The, 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 the words are not the important part. It's, it's what the words represent that you are placing your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so if, if you would like to trust Christ today, if you would like to become a Christian, if you would like to be saved, if you would like to be born again, redeemed, converted, all these are words that mean the same thing. You're going from being a lost person bound for hell to a saved person bound for heaven. If that's what you want, then would you pray something like this? Lord Jesus, I know you came, died, were buried, and rose again on the third day for me. I know you came to save sinners, and I am one. I admit that to you, and I want you to be my savior. And I'm asking you to come into my life and save my soul. And I am trusting you from this moment on, and nothing else to get me to heaven when I die. You see, my friend, if you'll pray something like that and mean it and believe it, then you'll have eternal life. You'll be saved. You'll be born again. And Easter will be the most wonderful and meaningful thing in the world to you. You'll understand, finally, what it's all about. And so I hope and pray that if you need to, you'll pray that prayer. And then the other question I want to ask is, is for Christians. The first question was, do you believe? The second question is this. Uh, are you concerned right now? Are you worried about what's going on around you right now? And I want to encourage you as a Christian to take heart in, these, in, the, in this glorious truth that we've just talked about today. Easter should be a reminder to us that no matter what is going on around us, no matter what is arrayed against us, no matter what problems come into our life, it's already solved and the victory is already won. And so Christians, if you today are concerned or worried, if you're struggling with what's going on, if you're going through some depression, if you're going through some hard times, oh, how I'm praying for you that you will uh, will see the reality of these things and take hope and take heart and rejoice in uh, the truth of them. You might need to pray. You might not need to pray this morning and say something like, Lord, I, I know that, uh, that these things are true, but I confess that I've, I've been worried. I've been afraid. This thing is getting to me. It's starting to mess with my head. I'm, I, I, I'm not handling this well. And if that's the case, Lord, would you please, please help me? to uh, rejoice in you. Increase my faith. As the apostles prayed, I pray, Lord. Increase my faith. And uh, help me, Lord, to rejoice in the glorious truth. Easter's still here. He's still risen. He's still risen indeed. Father, I do pray. If there are folks who need to pray some of these prayers, they do so. And uh, we thank you for the truths that we've talked about this morning. May everyone have a glorious and happy Easter. May they be reminded of its true meaning. And may they all know the reality of the risen Savior. I pray that everyone hearing my voice would be saved, would trust Jesus, would believe, 
and be strong in their faith. So we thank you that Jesus is risen, and we thank you in his name.